as you heard, my name is Maria, and for the past uh, seven or so years, I've been writing on a site called Brain Pickings about design, science, history, art, books, all the things that inspire me and move me and sort of make me excited about life. And uh, it, it's a site that, that doesn't run ads. It's supported through readers directly and indirectly, directly through donations and indirectly through books that I write about, which have an Amazon link and a public library link. And if people go to Amazon, I get a little kickback. But in any case, this model has worked for me and has helped me sustain the site. But I also think about the broader question of how do we provide alternatives for or alternatives to ad-supported journalism and media. And today, I want to share some of my thoughts with you on that. And that's actually a question that goes back very far. Um, one of my favorite examples comes from 1976, when Esquire commissioned a journalist to do a feature story that was going to be underwritten by the Xerox Corporation. And they paid him $40,000 plus $15,000 in expenses to do the story, which $55,000 for a single story is a lot of money today, but in 1976, it was a ton of money. But in fact, they were so proud about this that they sent out a big press release saying how um, ad-supported or sponsored feature stories were the future of feature writing and journalism, and they were so excited to bring this to the world. And at that point, E.B. White, who's one of my favorite writers, uh, wrote a letter to the editor of Esquire because he was so outraged, and he said this was the end of the free press. And um, he wrote, and he said, sponsorship in the press is an invitation to corruption and abuse. The temptations are great, and there is an opportunist behind every bush. A funded article is a tempting morsel for any publication, particularly for one that is having a hard time making ends meet. Now, making ends meet is a challenge for a lot of publications today, and the feature, the sponsored story, has taken a lot of evolution or devolution, depending on how you look at it, since 1976, and today we have a lot of advertorials. Um, most recently and most notoriously, of course, the um, Atlantic Scientology incident, where um, the Atlantic ran this sponsored piece about the Church of Scientology. Um, it was marked as sponsored, but it was very prominent. They got a lot of flack for it. To their credit, they handled it really, really well, um, pulled it down, issued an apology, basically said, we're trying new ways, we're just trying new models. But they still got a lot of flack, and um, one of my favorite journalists, Sandra Sullivan, put it in terms perhaps even more poetic than E.B. White. Um, he said it was ad hortum of a particularly egregious variety. Now, sometimes the loss of editorial control um, with advertising isn't even voluntary. Um, here's something that happened to me about two weeks ago. Ironically, whilst researching something for this talk, um, this is the New York Times. This is my browser. It told me the New York Times had malware ahead. Danger, it said, exclamation point. Um, so of course, I was totally shocked. I Googled it. Turns out one of the largest ad servers on the web had been hacked and infected with malware, and they were serving on the Times. Consequently, this. Now, this tension between the editorial side and the business side is actually much older than the 70s, and it goes back all the way to the dawn of modern media as we know it, which, by the way, is a model that we have really failed to innovate on since the golden age of, of newspapers in the beginning of the 20th century. What we see today online is basically the same ad-supported newspaper that existed then. And back then, a journalist um, named Bruce Bliven wrote a piece in 1923 called Our Changing Journalism, in which he basically lamented how um, the circulation manager, or the olden days version of the SEO manager, had taken over the role of the editor as in deciding what goes in the paper and why. And he wrote about things that seem enormously contemporary. He wrote about the enormous increase in advertising, the universal use of syndicated material, the premium put on haste and on rushing out very skeletonized, he said, articles. And most importantly, he wrote an increasing use of pictures, hello BuzzFeed, uh, which have been found to appeal to large numbers of people who are almost illiterate, but possess the buying power which the advertiser seeks. And then he went on to talk about the tendency to condense and summarize news, so the listicles that we know today, and the wider use, again, of regurgitated syndicated material that makes every site look like any other site. 
And at the end, he wrote, circulation men fight to the death for every last 100 subscribers. Unfortunately, their race for added sales is reflected editorially in the production of journals, which more and more represent not an editor's notion of a good paper, but a circulation manager's notion of a good seller. And so this is the part that, in its most extreme forms, can manifest today with ad-supported media. And actually, fast forward about nine decades, and my friend Alyssa Walker, who's an amazing journalist, writes for Fast Company and uh, Good and Dwell and a lot of other publications, wrote a piece in, I think, 2010 or 2011 that was called um, The Five Things That Bother Me About This Headline. And she basically recounted the story of how her editor had retitled and bullet pointed a piece she had written. And at first she was appalled, but then she saw that it worked better by the metrics that we have, which is page views. And she kind of got obsessed with that and started tailoring her own pieces and being on social media and all of that. And it began to change who she was as a writer. And the last, the fifth point I think is the most important. She says, I wonder if I'm still a writer or if I'm a content creator. And this, of course, raises the question, what is a writer today? And we go back to Yubi White, who said, a writer has the duty to be good, not lousy, true, not false, lively, not dull, accurate, not full of error. He should tend to lift people up, not lower them down. Writers do not merely reflect and interpret life, they inform and shape life. And I think anyone who is in any form in journalism has the ideal of, in some way, framing for people what matters in the world and why and shaping public opinion. And the challenge, th none of this is to say that advertising is inherently evil or that the people who make a living with ad-supported media have no integrity, but it is to say that when it begins to invert that dynamic, when public opinion begins to shape what we call journalism, then that's a dangerous thing. But, 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 today we're being optimistic, so I want to talk about some alternatives to that, and there are some very heartening alternatives to that. Um, actually, most famously in, uh, in the past, in the time between I was asked to give this talk and today, the most, the best example is, um, again, one of my favorite journalists, Andrew Sullivan, who um, left the Daily Beast and he and his small team just went indie and started the dish on their own um, with subscriptions, with mem supported by members, ad-free. And Andrew said in an interview recently, I think advertising could provide us a non-trivial amount of money, but we felt we'd rather have less money and have a very pure, simple concept. In some ways, we're breaking up cartels and creating a true kind of journalistic capitalism. Those sites that readers really want to stay in existence will have to earn that. And that's what I would like to believe. And it might be utopian and naive, but I really do think it can work. It is an alternative. It, it doesn't have to be the way, the only way. Um, but of course, the day that Andrew announced this, I gladly subscribed, and so did many other people. And his, they're the small team, they're doing really well so far in meeting their goal of $900,000 for the year is what they estimated it would cost to run the site and to pay healthcare for the seven, seven employees, I think, so far. In any case, but you don't have to be sort of an indie hippie single person like myself or a small team of pragmatic idealists like Andrew and The Dish in order to make this work. And I think it's absolutely possible and, and, and it is the case that there are many great journalists who are able to do the same thing, to basically shape public opinion with integrity and, and with a point of view within the traditional um, mainstream media model. Another one of my favorite journalists is David Carr, who happens to work within the New York Times. Um, David recently did a Q&A in Reddit, and he said, I've, really, I've never really given a rip about money. Now, I believe him 100%, not just because I know him as a person, but because I know him as a writer. And he is one of the most brilliant, no bullshit, give it to you straight journalists out there. And if he were to take what he does now with the Times, which I have no doubt he does because he believes in and not because he gets paid, and to move that elsewhere, whether it's to another media organization or branch out on his own, I would follow him in a heartbeat, and I think so would many, many, many other people. And I think that's amazing. But if you do happen to be an individual, single, hippie person like myself trying to run something like this, it's not necessarily, it doesn't run on air either. Um, we have this perception that because the barriers of entry are so low for creating content online, anyone can do it. And it's true and it's false. It is simple in technical terms, but it is neither easy nor cheap. So this is roughly what it costs me to run brain pickings every month. 
I spend money on web hosting, which is one of the largest expenses. Um, my email and email newsletter delivery, Typekit, which makes things look pretty, um, VaultPress, which backs up my WordPress and gives me enormous peace of mind. The books that I spend money on, I, I can get some of those for free, review copies from publishers, but because a good chunk of what I write about ends up being out of print things. Those can be, apart from a, a huge time suck to find, really, really expensive. Um, and then incidental admin costs, like proofreader, designer, developer, uh, interns, if I have any at the time, that sort of thing. And then all the data plans and communication needs that basically allow me to get on the internet um, for to do what I do. And so if you add all of that up, that's about $3,600 a month. Oh, and I, you know, I forgot to include in this that I rent a, a desk at Studio Mates, so that's even more than that. But in any case, that doesn't include my time, the, the man or the woman hours that I put into doing it. And I spend between 12 and 18 hours a day doing what I do because brain pickings is pretty much my life. That, that's all I do, every, everything feeds into it, every waking moment the books that I read, the research that I do, the people that I talk to. You know, I ride my bike out here and I listen to Radiolab and it gives me ideas, that sort of thing. So even with a conservative estimate of the hours, and if I were to pay myself minimum working wage, which in New York State as of last month is $8.50 an hour, so if I spend the same amount of time cleaning toilets or flipping burgers or whatever, that is what the graph would look like. And it would be about $7,000 a month just to run it. Now, this works for me, and it's just one way of doing it, but many other people are making it work, and there are some really, really cool and inspiring and interesting models out there. Um, my, woo, my buddy Mark Armstrong, who um, runs Long Reads. Long Reads has been around pretty much longer than any of those other sites curating long form reading around the web, he has a membership model where as a long reads member, not only do you support the, the site, but you also get certain perks. So every month he works with authors to get exclusive excerpts from books or new essays or things that you get emailed as a member. Um, there is, of course, public media, which have been around for a long time, and, but now we're really revolutionizing the model. So Radiolab, which is probably my favorite um, radio show on the uh, public radio airwaves, at least. Um, they, they, they run on, on WNYC, so they do the standard public radio membership model. But as of last year, they started doing this thing where they do Radio Lab Live. And these are live shows that do really, uh, I mean, they're amazing. I, if the next one, I highly recommend you go to it. They do live storytelling, but they, they also have music acts and all kinds of multimedia stuff. And it's amazing, and it helps them fund the actual show on the radio, the proceeds from these live events. And of course, there's Roman Mars, who uh, runs a show called 99% Invisible, which is kind of like Radio Lab for design and architecture. Last year, he set out to raise money for the new season of 99% um, on Kickstarter, and he asked for $42,000. He ended up raising more than $170,000, um, which instantly made it the largest, fun the most funded media project in the history of Kickstarter. And it's amazing, it's, it's such an inspiring affirmation that not only do people give a shit about supporting things that matter to them, but they give $170,000 worth of shit. And I think it's amazing. And of course, there are other things. So just this week, um, this thing, I came across this, it's called Science Studio. It's basically like multimedia, radio lab, um, science storytelling, but not just audio. And actually, it's a project um, in which, uh, behind which are some people that are involved in traditional media, um, including Scientific American and TED and you know, journalists that write for actually established um, things. And then there's Spot.us, which basically allows people to fund news stories in their community and to make happen the stories that they think are important to be reported. Um, there's The Wire Cutter, which um, is Brian Lamb's project. He's a former Gawker guy, and it's like an interesting hybrid model. They use, you see there's an ad at the top, but it's pretty ad-free throughout, and it's a product review and recommendation site, and they use affiliate links to um, any product that people buy through the site, they get some revenue off of that too. Then there's Flatter, which is basically every month you allocate a budget that you want to donate to sites that you already read, and then it gets automatically distributed amongst the sites that you visit that have the Flatter button 
which can be an interesting model, but I think the danger with a lot of these implementations is that it, there's a bit of a circuitous logic in that it'll only work if sites implement the system, and sites will only implement the system if it's successful. And so it's kind of a loop. But it's, again, another way to explore and super interesting. Um, my friend Len Kendall and a bunch of his collaborators launched something similar called SentUp, um, which is pretty much like Flatter, but there's a charity component. So when you go read Slate or The Times or Brain Pickings or whatever you read, and you click the button, part of that money goes to the site, and a small part goes to um, charity. And then there's individual people, like myself. There's this guy, Joe Hansen, out of Austin. He runs a site called It's OK to be Smart. It's probably my favorite blog right now. Um, it's Science Plus. He has a donation button. And very honestly, there's his value proposition right there. He says, I'm working to change the way science is communicated. You know, Help make this happen. Together we can. I donate to him monthly. I think he's amazing. And then I came across this random thing just while doing my regular reading. It's a tiny, tiny site that happens to curate writing by writers of color, but it does so really well. All this stuff is really interesting, really well written. And it says right there at the top why he or she needs donations. Every donation I receive goes towards paying off medical debt. And by the way, th if you click that thing in the bottom that says three, um, it gives you their public stats. It's a site that has less than 1,000 visitors a month. And yet it works for them. Um, and it's really lovely. Now, this week in The New Yorker, Adam Gopnik, who's one of my favorite long-form journalists, had a piece about Galileo. And in it, he shares this anecdote or sh a scene from a 1947 play about Galileo in which um, his apprentice approaches him and sort of you know, chastises him for having betrayed the Copernican faith. And he says to Galileo, Unhappy is the land that breeds no heroes. And Galileo turns to him and says, no, unhappy is the land that needs a hero. And I think in a lot of ways, the landscape of media and publishing can be very unhappy today because there needs to be a hero, but we don't necessarily willingly acknowledge that. Um, in fact, a few weeks ago, I spoke at a salon at MoMA and one of my co-speakers was Jeff Jarvis, who, as you probably know, is one of the most prominent sort of thinkers and writers about journalism. He teaches at CUNY, the J School. And before the salon, we were catching up, and Jeff was telling me about the class that he's teaching this semester, which deals with the business side of journalism. And I asked him, well, are you teaching these kids about alternatives to ad-supported journalism? And he said, in complete earnestness, just totally serious and not mocking, he said, no. And I said, why? He said, well, it's impossible to make a living any other way. And my heart sank. My heart really sank. Not because he's not right. I think perhaps he's right to some degree. But because if we don't give these young people coming up the hope that there are other ways, and most importantly, the awareness that those other ways are up, for, up to them to invent and to experiment with, then it's kind of sad. Not because advertising, again, is evil, but because whenever any one way becomes the way, I think that's a dangerous thing. But I'm optimistic, and what I subscribe to, both in, in this and in life in general, is what my favorite graphic designer believes, Milton Glaser, who you probably know as the creator of the famous I Heart New York logo. And he says in Debbie Millman's fantastic book, um, How to Think Like a Great Graphic Designer, he says, if you perceive the universe as being a universe of abundance, then it will be. If you think of the universe as one of scarcity, then it will be. I always thought that there was enough of everything to go around, that there are enough ideas in the universe and enough nourishment. Thank you.